This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows granger has got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. About a year ago, President Joe Biden went to Chicago. He was there to hard launch some brand new campaign terminology. Thank you all very much. And Bob, thank you for that introduction. Bob's been helping me for a long Specifically, time. Specifically, he was there to embrace a single word, a word that he thought would clearly define his economic legacy in the White House. The word was Bidenomics. So I came into office determined to change the economic direction of this country, to move from trickle-down economics to what everyone on Wall Street Journal and Financial Times began to call Bidenomics. I didn't come up with the name. I really didn't. I now claim it. To emphasize the point, the stage he spoke at was wallpapered with posters, all embracing Bidenomics in big, bold font. In fact, over the following months, Biden used this term as a recurring catchphrase. Bidenomics is about the future. Bidenomics is just another way of saying, restore the American dream. And guess what? Bidenomics is working. When I took office, the pandemic... Was- I cannot remember the first time I heard Bidenomics. Annie Lowry writes about the economy for The Atlantic. And though she does not remember how this term became so ubiquitous, she does know something about what it means. Bidenomics was meant to be cheeky, a way to take advantage of what Annie calls the strongest economy the United States has ever experienced. Because if you look at the numbers, that's what's going on right now, an economic boom. The problem is that a year after the White House fully embraced Bidenomics, Not many Americans feel like this is the strongest economy they've ever experienced. And when I talk to people about this and I'm like, why, why do you think the economy is so bad? They're often like, and I I think this is not wrong. Like, I really credit this. They're like, it's $15 to get lunch at like Chick-fil-A or Burger King. What is happening? And I'm like, yeah, that's true. You know, (laughs) like, yeah, the price has gone up a lot. You've heard this story before. You've lived this story. Inflation has been pumping up prices for years at this point. To some people, what's happening feels like a recession, even though it's not. That feeling has even gotten a name, the vibes session. But Annie says, stories that blow off what's going on right now as vibes, they miss something. And there's this other half of the ledger, right? So We have had for a long time in this country a kind of brewing cost of living crisis that I think really we could date it from, you know, oh, God, you could go back decades. But I'm going to go ahead and say that, you know, the seeds really get planted in the housing bubble. We stop producing enough housing. It's not just housing, though. Child care costs are brutally high. Health care costs are going up. Don't even start with the cost of higher education. In other words, to a lot of people, their post-inflation grocery bill, it feels like the straw that broke the camel's back. Which brings us back to Bidenomics. Because if you ask people who they blame for their bad economic vibes right now, a lot of them point the finger directly at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I noticed around last month that the word Bidenomics had disappeared from the White House lexicon? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) It seemed like an admission of defeat. It's tough. One thing that I think is about interesting about inflation, it's why people really don't like it, is, you know, let's say that you transact, you pay for something like five times a day, right? You grab some groceries, maybe you pick up coffee with a friend, you got to pay for your kids' gymnastics. It's like every single time you do that, you get this flash of like, oh gosh, everything's so expensive. How am I going to afford anything? And it really, really ticks people off. And I think that's why the Biden administration stopped talking about it. People are like, don't gaslight me. 
Today on the show, the death of Bidenomics and what it says about the election come November. I'm Mary Harris. You're listening to What Next. Stick around. This episode is brought to you by Discover. When it comes to your finances, Discover wants you to know they are the credit card that is always there for you. With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, that means no more waiting for, quote, normal business hours just to get a hold of someone. We are talking real service from real people whenever you need it. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. This episode is brought to you by Discover. When it comes to your finances, Discover wants you to know they are the credit card that is always there for you. With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, that means no more waiting for, quote, normal business hours just to get a hold of someone. We are talking real service from real people whenever you need it. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. So here's a question. What made embracing Bidenomics such a good idea in the first place? I asked Annie to lay out the case that what we're all experiencing right now is an unprecedented economic boom. To start, she said, just look at the unemployment rate. What's kind of remarkable to me is that unemployment is low and steady at about the lowest that economists think it can go in a healthy economy, because you still you don't want unemployment to be zero. You want people to be able to be trading and shifting jobs. And that below four percent is a rate that economists you know, think is 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 pretty great and indicates that your economy is really healthy. And uh, that has facilitated wage growth. It's facilitated nominal wage growth. So literally the amount you see on your paycheck has probably gone up. It's increased a lot more for lower wage workers than high wage workers. And that results in something called wage compression. So basically the difference between a high wage worker, like a lawyer or somebody, an accountant making $100 an hour, and a low wage worker, maybe somebody making $14 an hour um, uh, at a job at a big box store, that type of thing, that difference has, has kind of collapsed, which is a really, really important thing. And we haven't just seen nominal wage growth. We've also seen real wage growth, and that means wages after you account for inflation. So people have more purchasing power. They, it's not just that they have more money and prices have gone up, so it's eating up all of those wage gains. It's that they have more money such that they can buy more stuff. Hmm. Is there a way that there's bad news hidden in here? Like I know some people have pointed out that Unemployment numbers, they measure people who are actively looking for work. So are there some people who are just sitting this out right now and and we're maybe not seeing something problematic? Sure. We've had um, not great labor force participation for a while. And, And by a while, I mean decades. Really low wages were the cause of that for a long time because people just feel less motivated to go out and get a job if the job that you're applying for is only going to pay you like nine fifty an hour, right? It's literally just not enough of an incentive to bring you into the labor force. But we have seen really, really, really great increases in employment um, for folks that often have a lot of trouble in the labor market. So young workers without a lot of experience. Um, workers with a felony on their record are folks that are reintegrating to economic life, having been in a spell of incarceration. We're seeing older workers work more, which sometimes we don't want, right? Because that can be a real sign of economic stress, right? Like we want people to be able to retire or to step back at the end of their lives. But a lot of folks, older workers, are joining the workforce for part-time jobs because they'd like to work 10 hours a week and make 20 bucks an hour. That's great for them. And that's, you know, benefiting them in their retirement. 
And so um, I've seen, I think that we've actually seen a lot of really positive trends. And I know that sometimes folks worry, is this all just gig work and part-time work? And no, we're seeing really good growth in full-time jobs. And where we're seeing folks take part-time jobs, it's, it's often not for economic reasons. It's um, because they want part-time work. Hmm. Okay, so you've laid out really good things that are happening. Like people are getting jobs when they want them. There's wage growth. But with all of these good things, it still feels like I go to the grocery store and my bill is incredibly high. Why is that? We had a really, really dramatic spell of inflation and it's cooled off a lot now, but it was really destabilizing folks because prices went up a lot and now they've stayed high. They haven't come down. And so we didn't see just the price of little stuff go up. We also saw the price of things like rent and cars and all of the really expensive stuff that went up quite a bit. I want to talk about those bigger ticket items because, as you said, like the inflation is moderating now. But there are these particular areas where it seems quite stubborn, like housing and car insurance. Why is that important? Yeah, because we pay so much for those and we can't. Right. To be without a house is to be in a terrible situation. And uh, very often in rent, people will kind of pay what they afford. A lot of folks are paying an amount that's okay for them, but that doesn't account for the trade-offs they've made to get to that amount. So maybe you really want to live in Brooklyn, but like that's not going to work for you because it's so expensive and you have kids. You're going to live out in Long Island or you're going to commute in from New Jersey. And so you're paying, you know, $2,500 a month and that's what you can afford, but you're really mad because you have a really long commute and you don't want to live there. And I think that that scenario is what a lot of people have found themselves in. And then just in general, yeah, rent has gone up a lot. Right now, cars got really expensive due to supply problems during the pandemic. And now you're seeing this issue where financing a car is extremely expensive and the cost of car insurance has gone up a ton um, for a bunch of kind of complicated reasons. And so, you know, the, the actual ticket amount is not really reflective of the price given, you know, the cost of everything else. Because most, a lot of people, some people buy cars in cash, but a lot of people obviously have to finance them. Hmm. It's interesting because you're laying out this case for why the vibe session makes sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think it does. There's this thing called the misery index. So it's just the unemployment rate and the inflation rate. And um, notably, the misery index right now is going to be pretty low in the U.S., right? The unemployment rate is low and the rate of inflation is low, but the price levels are higher than people want them to be. And again, that unemployment, it's not translating in the way one thing might think it would into, you know, benefits for Joe Biden. There's really interesting political science research showing that hard economic statistics seem to be less correlated or less predictive of presidential approval than they used to be. Voters consistently say the economy is one of their top priorities. Is that not actually true? There's interesting research showing that bad economies are more salient to voters than good economies. So it's so it's like if it's bad, it's going to feel really bad. If it's good, it'll just feel like we're fine. Yeah. Bad economy, punish party in power. Good economy gives you a little space to think about other things that you might care about when you're voting. But right now we have good economy and not sure how we feel about the party in power. Yeah. There's also research showing that the direction of the economy matters more than its actual state. And so the economy is not improving a lot right now. It's kind of like same, same. It's great. It's really good, but it's not getting better. So maybe you're not feeling that like updraft Hmm. feeling. And maybe that helps explain some of this. It strikes me that the things that are going well, economically speaking, are also things that could be attributable to personal factors, like wage growth. If I'm getting a raise, a job feels like something I have control over. Like, I'm working really hard to get that money. But like the cost of food at the grocery store or a mortgage, that feels like cosmic forces. Like, I just show up and that's what it is. And that may be part of what's at play here. Absolutely. 
So if you're unemployed and you're going to find a job, um, the likelihood of your finding a job is pretty heavily determined by just how the economy is doing. But to you, you might think, well, I have the capacity, I outcompeted. And that's true at an individual level, right? Like you did get that job. Same thing exactly. Like, you know, very awesome wage increases. Like it's like presented as a bonus. You've done a great job, $3,000 more for you per year. And you're like, wow, that's great. I get a couple hundred extra bucks every month. That's wonderful. And that might just be because, um, you know, your business is trying to retain workers. Um, But to you, you're like, I did a great job. And you did do, you know, a great job. The other thing is, I think that the United States had gotten used to an equilibrium in which wages were low, but stuff was cheap, right? And now with wages higher, the cost of just some basic consumer goods are higher. And I think people aren't used to that. And then, you know, I think that the big ticket items remain the real problem. If rents were lower, I think people would feel better about this situation. I think that's such a good point that like this bargain we made for like decades is being kind of renegotiated. But we didn't say so at the beginning. Yeah. And so all of a sudden it just looks really tough. Absolutely. The other thing is, in, you know, unemployment is a some people problem. It is absolutely devastating, especially long term unemployment for the people experiencing it. Inflation is an everybody problem. Everybody experiences inflation. Everybody is ticked off. Inflation is a lot easier to deal with if you're a rich person than a poor person because poor folks, right, like they're only spending really on necessities. But like you can talk to a fairly high income person and they'll be like, man, Disney World, Starbucks, have you seen the prices at Starbucks? Like they're annoyed by it too, right? We'll be right back after the break. In 1978, gay people in California faced a dire threat. Proposition 6, the Briggs Initiative. The teaching profession is riddled with the homosexual element. John Briggs is going to fire every gay and lesbian school teacher in the state of California. I'm Christina Cotarucci. This season on Slow Burn, we'll explore how a nationwide backlash against gays and lesbians led to a massive showdown in California. This was tens of thousands of pissed off gay guys and lesbians roaring down Market Street. With so much at stake, young people became activists. We've got to fight back. We can't let this happen in California. And activists became leaders. My name is Harvey Milk, and I'm here to recruit you. Slow Burn, Season 9, Gays Against Briggs. Out now, wherever you listen. Okay, you've laid out an economy that I think is uniquely challenging for a politician right now. People are overall upset about it, but at the same time, the economic indicators look good from a traditional standpoint. Even if people say they care about the economy, maybe they don't, but then maybe it's coloring their overall feelings about the world. I guess I want to talk about what's a politician to do. Absolutely. There's not a lot an administration can do in the short term to affect prices. So we have a lot of tools to affect demand in the economy, tools that Congress and the White House control. So things like expanded unemployment insurance payments, um, you know, just the checks that Trump sent out, right? Like, here's a check for you. Um, That controls the demand side of the economy. But in terms of controlling prices and the supply side, we don't have a lot. If Joe Biden wants to get prices down, yeah, he can release some some gas from the strategic reserve. Um, He can uh, eliminate tariffs that would bring prices down. You can build a lot of infrastructure, a lot of housing, but that takes a really long time, right? Um, So I think that this is a really tough problem. So what have they done? They've started to do stuff on antitrust, which should have the effect of increasing competition among businesses and reducing prices, but that takes some time. Yeah, that's not like a six-month fix. Absolutely. And a lot of our antitrust stuff is like, I'm going to block this merger. 
which isn't going to affect prices. It's just going to prevent them from going up in the future, right? Blocking mergers. Um, they started to do some stuff on like junk fees and resort fees, but that's pretty marginal. It's not like people are feeling really economically strapped because of fees. It's just something that they could kind of, you know, grab onto. But yeah, if you're if you're you know a senator or you're in the White House, what are you going to do about car insurance prices? You're not gonna you're not going to do anything. There's nothing that you can do. <laughs> I mean, it strikes me that Joe Biden's been running on what he has done. Because he has done a lot. It makes sense in theory. But when people can't feel what you've done, like that infrastructure package doesn't feel like much to you, it becomes difficult. And maybe the solution becomes to run on what you will do. Like we've talked about something like housing. Do you think like if you're Joe Biden, you should be talking a lot more about the fact that people can't find a place to live that they want to live in and how you might address that in the next administration. Yeah, look, I think this is a place where negative partisanship becomes really important, right? You don't want the other guy. He is going to put in place tariffs that are going to raise prices. Um, He is going to deport a bunch of immigrants that's going to be hard for agricultural communities. He's going to take away your access to abortion and to family planning technologies and medicines. Um, that's, That's one thing. Um, I also, I just give them some, that I have some sympathy for the fact that if you have strong wage growth that's strongest at the bottom, and wage growth has tempered a bit, so I'll, I'll note that, and, and you have such low unemployment, it's just hard that you can't just run on that. That's tough. It's tough that even with both of those things, which I think of as the most important things economically, um, as well as, you know, GDP growth just generally increasing, if you can't run on that, like, that's tough. It's tough that you can't convince people that's a good economy. As I've been talking, I've just been thinking about how I feel like people of our generation kind of live under the tyranny of the catchphrase, it's the economy, stupid. When it comes to politicians, you know, which was like a Clinton thing, like it's the economy, stupid. I kind of wonder, though, if something has flipped now, given everything you've said about how Americans view the economy, about how slippery it is in terms of who gets political credit for it and who even should. Is the economy secretly a losing issue? Like, is there any way for a modern president to win at the economy? There's this idea that is associated with um, Ron Engelhardt and Pippa Norris, who's she's still at Harvard now, post-materialism. And the idea is that if we go back to the 1960s, right, like still a pretty considerable share of American houses, they don't have indoor plumbing. And folks don't get enough calories when there's recessions, which still happens. But um, there's just a lot more of sort of subsistence level, right? Like, is our electricity on? Things are just a lot harder. We've had just an increase in material abundance that, you know, inequality has really shaped our understanding of that. But it is true that, you know, just just most families now um, have a material abundance, even if they're low income, that would have seemed shocking 50 years ago. And there's this idea that as you get this kind of material abundance, you enter this post-material phase in which voters can, um, and participants in civic life can think about other issues. So LGBT rights, um, environmentalism, immigration, these sorts of things that like, maybe you just have more space to kind of like imagine, imagine the world. And I think that that's happened. And I think that we saw that um, a little bit in especially Republicans that have moved to a place where I don't think that Republicans are primarily motivated by economic issues anymore. And the Republican Party doesn't really have a strong economic message in a lot of cases. A lot of it is, you know, we call it cultural, and I'm not even sure that's the best word, but a lot of it is about, right, like about immigration. A lot of it is um, about LGBTQ issues. A lot of it is about faith and family and identity. I mean, they'd say the immigration issue is rooted in in economics. They'd say it's about jobs. Absolutely. But I also think that it's rooted in a certain nationalism, 
right? We've just become much more polarized and much more partisan. We sort of have that partisan identity and then how we view the world, we kind of like back out of, we have this motivated reasoning, right? And so if Donald Trump is in charge, I'm going to look for the economic statistics that confirm my belief that he is bad and tell you why the economy is bad. Or if Joe Biden is in charge, like, I hate that guy. I want Donald Trump back. I'm going to tell you about like, you know, the price for everything and, and why this isn't great. It's creating this world in which, you know, the economy might just be somewhat less politically salient. And we're not really ready for that, right? Like, we think it's the economy is stupid. And when you ask people in polls, they still say the economy is the most important thing. But what actually gets the marginal voter to vote? Is it the economy? Are we sure? This election, do we think that those those voters that, you know, are going to determine the election in that handful of swing states, like what do they actually really care about? What is actually motivating to them? Even if they say that the economy is important to them, it's not that I don't trust people when they say that. But I think that, you know, like what actually gets people out is is kind of, you know, it's complicated. Annie, I'm really grateful for your time and your reporting. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Annie Lowry covers the economy over at The Atlantic. And that, that's our show. What Next is produced by Paige Osborne, Elena Schwartz, Rob Gunther, Madeline Ducharme, and Anna Phillips. We are led by Alicia Montgomery with a little boost from Susan Matthews. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations here at Slate. And I'm Mary Harris. Thanks for listening. Catch you back here next time. Ah, the sizzle of McDonald's sausage. It's enough to make you crave your favorite breakfasts. Enough to head over to McDonald's. Enough to make you really wish this commercial were scratch and sniff. And if you're a sausage person, now get two satisfyingly savory sausage McGriddles, sausage biscuits, or sausage burritos for just $3.33. Or mix and match. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. Single item at regular price. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.